Hello, Saints. I've uh, decided to send out some devotionals that will hopefully give you and your family some encouragement, some maybe hopefully some rich biblical themes to think about uh, during this time. And I've, I've kind of created a theme for these devotionals. Now, we're no longer in Lent. This probably would have been a more appropriate Lenten theme. But I think in many ways, what we're experiencing right now is kind of like a national Lent. The theme of these devotionals is going to be meeting Jesus in the desert. And I want to focus especially upon the Christian attitude towards trials and challenge uh, to our faith. How do we as Christians respond to trials and challenges? And I'd, I'd like to focus on um, some scripture passages that I hope are really uh, revealing, give us a sense of orientation, orient our hearts in times of trial and difficulty. So lesson one uh, has a little bit of an odd title. Lesson one is St. Anthony and Fighting the Devil in the Desert. Um, and uh, real quickly, as a, as a little bit of context for this, um, as a student of the early church and medieval history, I've often had occasion to think about St. Anthony. And for most of my life, I've thought of what St. Anthony did, uh, going out into the desert to um, be what's called an Aramite. Um, the letter for the, the word for desert is Aramos. So the word Aramite comes from this, this uh, picture of, you know, going out into the wilderness or going out into the, the desert. St. Anthony, to me, seemed to be doing something uh, selfish, uh, you know, going out on his own into the desert uh, to fight the devil. Um, it seems like foolishness at best and spiritual pride at worst. But recently it's dawned on me, whether or not St. Anthony was right to do it, it's, it's dawned on me. Uh, I think I have a better understanding of why he did it. And uh, he, he viewed the desert as an opportunity for spiritual training. So I've been thinking about this, um, you know, this, this attitude towards the desert. And first of all, let's talk about what the desert or the wilderness symbolizes. Of course, it, it symbolizes empty space. It symbolizes being in a place that really, in essence, is lifeless. We know, of course, that Jesus was sent into the wilderness, uh, into the desert to be tempted immediately after his baptism, to be tested immediately after his baptism. And what does the desert symbolize? Well, it's, it's, it symbolizes an experience that is common to us, a condition that is common to us when we experience trials. We feel like we are lacking support. Imagine wandering, children, imagine wandering into the middle of a desert, being dropped off in the middle of the desert, and not knowing even which direction to walk, looking all around and seeing, you know, sand in every direction, no real markers that tell us which way to go, um, nothing, no signs of civilization, no gas stations, convenience stores, grocery stores, drinking fountains, you know, nothing that ultimately can support us. Um, to be in the desert symbolizes lacking resources. And we might ask, why would God ever withdraw resources from us? Why would he put us into a position where we feel like we are in a desert? What is the purpose of this? So let's start by reading James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, very, very familiar verses, but I'm going to read these verses for you. Consider it, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete 
not lacking anything. So what James is telling us really has to do, it has to, it has to do with attitude. Notice what he says, consider it pure joy. Okay, so this is an attitude that James is asking us to adopt. The attitude is an attitude of joy. So we're told literally to take, to consider in this context means to take the attitude of. So we're given the opportunity in trials to have an attitude. And here's where we have to be honest. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be totally honest. Most of the time, our trust and our faith doesn't have to be in Jesus. Our trust and our faith is in many, 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 many things. Many, many, we might call them supports, support mechanisms, good things that God has given us. Um, you know, when you're driving on the road and you see a light up ahead, you assume if it's green for you, it's red for the cross traffic. You trust in that support system because you know if it's green for you and green for the cross traffic, something really bad could happen. So traffic lights are a support mechanism. Grocery stores are a support mechanism. Drinking fountains are a support mechanism. Public bathrooms are a support mechanism. We have around us in a civilization like ours, lots of support mechanisms. So we, we naturally trust in those things. We have many, many things as Americans, of course, that make us feel like we're not in the desert, that we're in a, a, a lush land flowing with milk and honey. But, but God brings the desert into our lives to cause, he withdraws those support mechanisms so that a trial by definition is this situation in which we don't feel support. We don't feel strength. We don't feel encouragement. A trial is a challenge in which God places us into the desert. Why? What is he doing? Why does he place us into the desert? What is his goal in placing us into the desert? And let's look at the next few verses in James. I think sometimes when we read James, we might forget to read. We read those verses, consider it pure joy, but notice what comes next. James chapter one, verses five and six. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. Notice the next verse. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. So we normally wrestle with doubt. We normally wrestle with doubt. And the doubt has to do with wondering if God is supporting us. Wondering if if the support mechanisms that God has put in place in the world are going to do their job, what do trials do? Well, first of all, in a trial, we learn how easily we are blown and tossed by the wind. Trials, first of all, reveal that we are people who don't trust God. They reveal how easily we are blown and tossed by the wind. Now, when you see that you're like a wave, James gives the image of a wave that's blown and tossed by the wind. If you realize that you're like a wave that's blown and tossed by the wind, the purpose of a trial is twofold. One, that you acknowledge this. I am not strong enough to deal with this trial. The desert doesn't work for me. Please bring me back to civilization. I can't handle this. So the first thing we realize in a trial is how easily we are blown and tossed by the wind. 
The second thing that we realize, once we realize that, is that we need more faith. Our faith needs strengthening. And the message throughout the Bible, again and again and again, is that God brings trials into our lives to strengthen us. Now, this seems paradoxical. Paradoxical. If you feel like a wave blown and tossed about by the wind, it probably doesn't seem like a trial is strengthening you. But what the trials do is they, first of all, make us realize our need for more faith, our need for more trust, our need to have our faith muscles strengthened. In essence, trials exist to train us. They're opportunities, okay? So the imagery that James uses is fascinating. He uses an image of maturity. So let's look back at James verses two and three, James chapter one, verses two and three, and I'll read it to you again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now notice, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, okay? The testing of your faith develops perseverance. So why do we experience trials? The answer is, very simply, to develop perseverance. Why do we need perseverance? Well, the image James uses then in verse four is perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Trials exist for the sake of our maturity. The desert exists to grow us up, to mature us, to cause us not to trust in the earthly support mechanisms that surround us, but to trust in Jesus, to build our house on the rock, to place our faith and trust in him and in him alone. That's why trials exist, to cause us to turn to him in faith. And in essence, what the desert does is it removes those other things that are in a way blessings given by God, that are support mechanisms given by God, and they're good things. God wants us to have those good things, but he removes them from us sometimes, or he makes us feel like they're removed so that we might trust in him. Well, how do, how do trials do this? I wanna to shift to another scripture, which I believe functions as sort of an elucidation an explanation, a fuller explanation of these verses in James. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. I think almost every time I've ever preached, <laughs> I've, I've used this passage. Um, but here we go. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So notice what he calls our trials. First of all, he says they are light and momentary troubles. Now, I think the trials that he's referring to are probably much worse than what we're presently experiencing right now. We're talking about possibly terrible first century persecutions, some of those persecutions coming from Jews in the church, some of those persecutions coming from pagans who thought that Christianity was some kind of Jewish heresy. Um, regardless, the first century church experienced great persecution. And these trials, Paul refers to as light and momentary troubles. What do they do? What do these light and momentary troubles do? Well, they fix our eyes, not on what is seen, which is temporary, 
but on what is unseen, which is eternal. The purpose of trials then is to shift our gaze. Okay, think of it this way in terms of a horizontal versus a vertical metaphor. If our gaze is shifted, is, is oriented horizontally towards the things that I've said, you know, the support mechanisms that are all around us, you know, traffic lights and drinking fountains and convenience stores. If our, if our gaze is fixed that way, then we might fail to recognize that our gaze isn't fixed this way until we see the need to fix our gaze this way. And that's what our light and momentary troubles do is they force us to fix our gaze heavenward, to turn away from temporary things and to turn towards God. And I, again, I'm going to let scripture comment on itself. You know, we're, as Protestants, we believe in the perspicacity of scripture, that scripture ultimately interprets itself and it tells us, it deepens itself by commenting on itself. So let's turn to another series of verses that I think are um, elucidations of both 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 and James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture and it's 1 Peter chapter 3 verses, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. So bear with me, it's a little bit longer of a reading. Um, but I think this is one of the most beautiful pictures of what God does to us in trials. Okay, here, here's what Peter says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So trials cause us to have faith. And remember what Hebrews says, faith is certainty about what we do not see. So by definition, it's not certainty in earthly things. It's certainty in our unseen heavenly possession. Peter refers to this as an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept or guarded in heaven for us. What eye has not seen and ear has not heard, that, that what we are anticipating and waiting that God is preserving for us, that's what trials do is force our gaze in faith to be turned away from our present supports. Here we have to imagine Jesus, Peter, sorry, listening to Jesus' teaching. Remember, of course, Peter's walking around with Jesus, listening to Jesus' sermons and the teachings, the various things that Jesus was teaching his disciples and, and the you know, many people who were following him. Remember, Peter was hoping that God would bring about an earthly messianic kingdom in which the apostles the apostles would be set up like the hasmonean dynasty as rulers over a sovereign autonomous israel the romans would be overthrown by an act of messianic military might kind of like the maccabees overthrowing the seleucids antiochus epiphanes being defeated by this little band of soldiers right so peter is thinking well that's what we're going to be we're going to be like the Maccabees. 
Jesus is going to be like Judas Maccabeus. He's going to lead us into a revolution. We're going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to establish, reestablish the autonomy of Israel, the political autonomy of Israel. And God will once again be on the throne of Israel. So he's ready to grab his sword and defend Jesus and help him bring about his kingdom. But remember, during Jesus's ministry, remember this particular teaching of Jesus. And I think this is what Peter has in mind in the passage that I just quoted. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this is the last point. I want to close with this. Trials reveal the attachments of our heart. And let's just be honest. Trials reveal how attached we are to this earth. How attached we are to the blessings we have in our lives. How attached we are to the good things we have. God gives us the trials of Job so that we may long to see his face. God gives us the trials of Job so that we may long to see him face to face, in person, in heavenly glory and majesty, clothed not with our mortal flesh, but clothed with our immortal bodies in the resurrection. This is what trials do. Peter has a doctrine that runs all throughout First Peter of aliens and strangers, or the felicitous phrase, strangers and sojourners. That God has made us strangers and sojourners. Strangers and sojourners in the world anticipating the kingdom that God is going to bring about in the fullness of time, in his glory, in his timing, in his way, in which there will be no more crying or mourning, pain or death, no more sickness, no more disease. And that's what we're longing for. And this brings us full circle to St. Anthony in the desert. The desert is an opportunity. God brings us into the desert to mature us, to grow us up, to cause us to trust in him and in him alone. He brings us into the desert to make our faith rest in him more. He brings us into the desert so that we might learn the sweetness of fellowship with him. Remember Elijah in that famous passage of, you know, God is not going to speak in an earthquake a whirlwind, a raging fire, but in a still small voice. He brings us into the desert so that we might learn to be quiet, to calm our anxieties and our fears, to withdraw our trust in earthly blessings so that we might rest in him alone. My admonition to you and your family is God has brought this trial to us. It is a test. How are we responding to the test? Are we responding to this test with agitation? Are you fundamentally agitated? How much of the day do you spend in agitation? This is a test. It's a trial. In a sense, we could say God is withdrawn some of our earthly supports. And we're sitting in a sort of cultural suspended animation. We're in the desert. Many of us are feeling this experience of being in the desert, having this sweet fellowship of being with one another in a way withdrawn from us. And it's a time of anxiety. It's a time of anxiety as we reflect upon the mistakes and the decisions of our civil magistrates uh, as you probably reflect on some of the mistakes that we will make 
as your elders, as we gropingly try to figure this out. My question is, are you developing faith muscles? Are you learning to trust in Jesus? Are we finding our satisfaction in him and him alone? Are you listening for that still small voice? Are you trying to use the trials now, this time in the desert, as a time to rest in him? And I want to read to you, I want to close with a passage from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 uh, through 16. Um, this is a, a special admonition to the Christians that Peter knew were suffering great trials and persecution. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is, re is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Let's pray. Dear Father, I thank you for the beloved saints at all saints, that you have knit and bound us together in Christ, that we are bonded to Christ. And because of that connection to Christ, we are strangers and sojourners and aliens in this world because we are citizens of your heavenly kingdom. We are citizens of Jesus's great kingdom. And we know one day that we will, as the meek, inherit the entire earth. We know that we will inherit not an earth full of sin and suffering and brokenness and sorrow and disease and warfare and famine, but we will inherit an earth, a newly created earth, in which we will go further up and further in to the glories of your heavenly joy, of your heavenly blessings that you will make manifest to us in perfection. O oh Lord, Maranatha, come quickly. We long for that day. And as we cry out in the desert, help us to hear your still small voice, build our faith muscles, strengthen our feebleness, and draw us closer to you. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Okay, saints, that's the end of, uh, of uh, Devotion 1, and I'll try to send out a few of these each week. I'll try to send out Devotion 2 in the next couple of days. Blessings.